Hello and welcome to The Game Changers, the podcast that celebrates trailblazing women in sport. I'm Sue Anstis, and I'd like to start with a big thank you to our partners, Sport England, who support The Game Changers through a National Lottery Award. I'm delighted to say that this, the 13th season of the podcast, is a serialization of my book, Game On, The Unstoppable Rise of Women's Sport. Chapter 18, The Girl Effect. The difference between a broken community and a thriving one is the presence of women who are valued. Michelle Obama. This is such an important chapter, but I found the thought of writing it more daunting than the others. It's a vast topic and not an area I've worked in directly, so I don't have the personal experience to draw on as I have with other areas of women's sport. There are lots of extraordinary programmes taking place across the world and the subject of how sport for development can change the lives of women and girls could make up many books in itself. I was keen to consider the powerful impact sport can have on some of the most prevalent problems affecting women and girls in the Global South, such as gender-based violence, childhood marriage and lack of education opportunities. To start with, I felt it was important to establish what we mean by sport for development rather than sports development. Until I began writing this book, I certainly could not have told you the difference. Sports development mainly focuses on developing a sport, usually to increase participation, and is often carried out by national and international sports bodies, clubs and charities. Development takes place by investing in publicity, along with the provision of equipment, instruction, coaches and access to facilities in order to introduce a sport to more people, be that as players, fans or coaches. This work can be beneficial for communities often enabling more girls and young women to get involved in sport and enjoy all its benefits in terms of confidence, teamwork, resilience, happiness and a sense of purpose. Some fantastic sports development programmes for women and girls have been delivered globally in recent years with substantial investments from the likes of FIFA, World Rugby and the ICC. Katie Sadlier talks passionately about some of the impressive work World Rugby has delivered for women across the world, such as its Try and Stop Us, Start Rugby, Become Unstoppable campaign, launched in 2019. It particularly picked out some of the places where we know women have more challenges and used women who had excelled through rugby to be inspirational role models to drive significant social change In those countries, Katie told me. Iran went from 3,500 women participating in rugby pre our campaign to well over 10,000 in just that period of time. It's fantastic when I look at the photos that get sent from countries like Iran or from Pakistan or from Syria or from Uganda and you look at those women playing and you know how physically challenging it is. It just makes you able to stand up for anything, on and off the field. Katie also told me how World Rugby has also made substantial investment into leadership. You invest in a leader and that woman changes the lives of others and then those women change the lives of others and those women change the lives of others. If I can do more to support the potential of women that want to lead, then that is just such a gift. It is wonderful to hear about the impact women's rugby is having across the world and there's no doubt this work is changing the lives of the women who take part and those in their communities. Sport for development is about using sport more directly as a tool to generate social change. It traditionally works in one of three ways. Supporting individuals to learn, grow and build confidence helping a community to change its attitudes or improve its living conditions, and potentially helping a nation to overcome conflict 
or its effects. It is also worth clarifying what we mean by sport in the case of sport for development. A useful description from the United Nations describes it as all forms of physical activity that contribute to physical fitness, mental well-being and social interaction, such as play, recreation, organised or competitive sport and indigenous sports and games. Evidently, there are lots of ways in which organisations are helping to drive social change in communities across the world. So why is sport so powerful? One of the key reasons is its popularity. Whether as participants, spectators or volunteers, people are attracted to sport, in many cases more than any other activity. Sport is popular in almost every community in the world, mainly because when it is delivered well, it can be fun and enjoyable for everyone involved, from those taking part through to those watching and supporting. Even in environments where people face horrible challenges in their everyday lives, the fact that sport can bring joy, fun and happiness should not be underestimated. Sport's role as a connector is also key as it can unite people and communities. By its very nature, sport is social, bringing together players, teams, coaches, volunteers and spectators. That is a large part of what we love about sport. The networks which develop through sport can be hugely inclusive, helping to combat exclusion and enabling communities to work together to address the challenges they face. The values we see in sport can also be powerful, including collaboration, respect for others, inclusion, teamwork and mutual support. These can be especially powerful in communities where women and girls may traditionally be excluded from much of society. In the past 30 years, sport has also emerged as global mass entertainment and in the process has become one of the world's most far-reaching communications platforms. Global sports events now reach millions and elite athletes have become influential ambassadors and role models for social development. Finally, and this is particularly powerful for women and girls, sport has the potential to empower, motivate and inspire. Sport develops and showcases people's strengths and capacities. It highlights what people can do and in many cases it can change gender perceptions. To understand more about sport for development and its potential, I spoke to Alexandra Shalat and Rada Balani from Beyond Sport, a global organisation that seeks to promote the role sport can play in creating sustainable social change. Alexandra points out that many people really don't understand sport for development or how it uses sport as a catalyst for change. Some of the biggest issues women are facing in the world right now are female-based violence, child marriage, Payment in the workplace, serious issues. Sport is doing a lot to address that on the ground through amazing organisations and that's where sport for development, specifically with women, lies. Sport, at a community-based level, is helping to address some of the biggest issues facing women. Rada goes on to explain that it is the intentional use of sport that enables it to be so impactful. It's not enough to bring a sporting programme or ambassador into a community and expect it to just change lives, as I'd often heard about with well-intentioned programmes taking kit and coaches out to women and girls in the Global South. Apparently, one of the biggest mistakes people make when thinking about gender equality in the sport for development context is believing that just because they are getting girls to play sport, this will automatically empower them to be equal in other ways. According to Rada, this is just not true. She tells me there's a misconception that sport is somehow magic and can solve societal issues. In fact, it only really works with the best programming and the right people in the right place at the right time. 
Many sports believe that sport builds character. Indeed, some sports to this day purport that the very nature of their sport builds character and that those that play it are better people as a result. Quite frankly, it's utter nonsense. For there to be sustained change, the use of sport and those traits that it does engender need to be intentionally programmed and drawn out, made relevant to life and done in safe spaces if we are to see changes in knowledge, in skills, in confidence, behaviours and beliefs in both individuals and communities. Rada talks about the powerful commodity of sport which, if deployed appropriately, will genuinely challenge things that we might never ever talk about. That could be female genital mutilation or the shame of menstruation, which in some societies has the secondary impact of girls not going into or continuing their education. It is sobering to think that a sport for development programme might enable a young woman to get an education or bear children or feed their family. The world could come out of poverty if only women were empowered to work and contribute and be part of that, says Rada. This final point that Rada makes is highlighted by Women Win, a global women's fund that envisages a world where every adolescent girl and young woman exercises her rights. International authorities from the World Bank to the United Nations agree that the most effective way to fight poverty in the world is to help girls and women. Research has shown that if you invest in girls, you invest in society because the education, increased earnings and human development of adolescent girls has a direct impact on their families. It's becoming known as the girl effect and because women often serve as primary caretakers, Every dollar invested in a girl also benefits her family and the community. It's clearly not enough then just to encourage girls to start playing football or rugby or netball and assume that the confidence this brings will automatically transfer to other areas of their lives, as many sports development programmes do. Maria Bobbenreath, Executive Director of Women Win, Explain to me what they discovered when Nike first began investing in this area about 20 years ago. What we saw was that the same issues that were keeping girls from the playing field were keeping them out of society. Things like period poverty. So if you don't have a way to manage your menstrual period one week a month, it's not that you only don't play sports, you don't go to school, and over time you drop out. What we saw where girls were playing on teams, they were helping each other deal with this because they didn't want any of the players to miss any of the matches. Maria explains they discovered many other issues that prevented adolescent girls from accessing sport. A lack of female coaches meant parents were worried about safeguarding, concern for their daughters playing sport and travelling to venues with men. A lack of changing rooms with nowhere for girls to use the toilet and change. Girls not having any bras or underwear. And as we worked with sports institutions and other women's rights organisations to address these issues, we saw not only the girls participated better in sports, but they were able to develop agency. They were able to develop access to networks of friends. They did better in school. Participation of girls made programmes and communities better. This was transformative and at that time was a radical idea. An example of how the impact of sport can change the lives of the most marginalised girls and young women is one win leads to another, a joint partnership between UN Women and the International Olympic Committee, a legacy of the 2016 Rio Olympics. The programme combines sport with life skills education for vulnerable girls in often violent communities. And what is most fascinating is the transformation that resulted. By the time the girls left the programme in Brazil, 89% said they were a leader compared to 46% before the programme. 
93% knew where to report violence. 79% knew how safe sex would reduce the likelihood of pregnancy compared to 25% before. 77% knew safe sex could prevent sexually transmitted infections compared to 21% before. 99% believed they would one day get a job. Extraordinary changes that would transform the lives of these young women and their communities. Hodi is a charity founded by Fatima Abdul Qadir Adan in Kenya, in a region where girls used to be forbidden to play football. Now it's changing their lives. As Fatima herself said in a BBC documentary, people look at a football and they see this round, useless thing. For me, it's the most powerful tool. Fatima started running football tournaments in northern Kenya in 2008, with a goal of tackling many issues that hurt young girls. In that first tournament, just 12 girls competed. Travelling with the girls, we'd hear people cussing us and saying, may you all break your legs. I was physically stoned and literally kicked out of the pitch. Moving forward a decade and more than 1,600 girls have competed. One of the girls in the 2018 tournament was 14-year-old Fatima Gufu. Coming from a very humble background, everything would have been a barrier for her, explains Fatima Abdul Qadir Adan. But the young Fatima says she wants to be the governor of Marsabit County in the future, a dream she would never have had without football. Fatima explains, Football changed me. I was so shy. My teams, we are with them for many years. We won matches. We even got a new jersey for the football team. I want to continue playing, but even if not, I will campaign for girls to continue. I want, in the future, to be a parent who is supporting football for girls. Doris Petra, Vice President of the Football Kenya Federation, explains why initiatives like this are so important for young women like Fatima. She comes from an area where women are not supposed to have a voice. They get married so early in life, they are not even taken to school. As well as bringing girls together to play football in between games, Hoddy runs sessions tackling child marriage and breaking the silence around female genital mutilation. Three million girls a year across Africa are at risk of being victims of female genital mutilation. This educational element is a critical component of the programme. And, along with the tournaments, Hoddy also runs a nine-month programme in schools. Fatima Abdul Qadir Adan concludes, We are currently in 152 villages. There are so many other villages that are out of our programme, but others hear the stories of these villages and they start asking, Why don't we also start doing this? Why are we marrying off our girls? We have broken the silence. Before, it was a cool thing for a 13-year-old, a 12-year-old girl to be married. Today, if you marry off a 13-year-old, the girls in those classes would complain. And not just the girls, the boys too. Moving the Goalposts, a sport for development charity in Kenya, is another pioneering organisation that uses football as a tool for gender equality, reaching out to young women who face huge challenges and complexities in life. Sarah Ford, who founded the charity, believes that football can provide opportunities for girls because seeing girls play football makes people wonder what more they can do. It makes people think about their prejudices against girls. I was convinced that sports could be used to address issues of girls dropping out of school, early marriages and pregnancies, as well as empowering young girls with life skills, she says. Moving the goalposts strongly believe that by empowering girls and young women, they can empower entire communities. Football is just one pillar of their programmes, 
which focus on providing fundamental economic and education opportunities through job and life skills and include education, livelihood, health, leadership and child protection. The charity also recognises the patriarchal nature of African societies, also the case in many societies globally, with men and boys as the custodians of culture and holding rigid views about gender roles and masculinity. This can be a big deterrent to women's and girls' empowerment. Without involving men and boys in gender equality and elimination of gender-based violence, is like a doctor treating symptoms and ignoring the disease, says the charity. They therefore also run a Young Men as Equal Partners program, which increases the number of gender transformative men and boys who can be agents of social change and champion the rights of girls and young women. Another hugely successful charity, which intentionally uses sport as a tool of empowerment and education for women, is free to run. Using adventure sports to develop female leaders in regions of conflict, the charity enables women and girls to safely and boldly engage in outdoor activity in conflict-affected regions including Afghanistan, Iraq and South Sudan. Since 2014, the charity has worked to create positive change in the lives of over 1,100 women and girls living in regions of conflict, combining sports programs, life skills development and community outreach to help women reclaim public space and change views about the roles they can and should play in a society. Participants run and hike with their team three to five times per week and also volunteer in their community, actively contributing to local projects. They are also taught life skills through sports, which include communication skills, conflict negotiation, leadership and service learning. Week-long leadership events then take participants outside their usual environments and enable them to try new activities like camping, kayaking, cycling, ice skating and skiing. Groups come together from different cultures where they share their experiences and learn from each other. Having enabled women and girls to pursue sporting challenges, the Free to Run programme then supports them to transfer these successes to their everyday lives so that they can be a force for positive change, shifting the attitudes of participants and their communities and increasing the opportunities for women and girls to engage in public life. Participants who successfully complete a year or more of free-to-run programmes are encouraged to lead life skills and sports sessions in their local schools, which creates a positive ripple effect for other women and girls in their own communities. And it's not just more traditional sports having impact. I was fascinated to learn more about Free Movement Skateboarding, an organisation offering free structured skateboarding workshops to young refugees, migrants and local people in Athens and its surrounding camps. My daughter Molly, who has spent time investigating the impact of skateboarding for young women, highlighted something I hadn't before considered. In many communities where girls are typically prohibited from participating in sports or don't due to societal norms, Skateboarding can give them access to physical activity and its numerous benefits. When Oliver Perkovich, the founder of Skaterstan, a charity empowering children through skateboarding and education, first took his skateboard to Afghanistan, he was intrigued to find that girls' interest in skateboarding was equal to the boys, when they were so excluded from all other forms of sport in Afghanistan. He realised This was because skateboarding presented somewhat of a loophole, its unknownness to Afghan society, meaning there had been no opportunity for it to be socially prohibited for girls. The unknown nature of skateboarding often works to its advantage in communities where more traditional sport for development initiatives fail. The potential for sport to change the lives of women and girls was highlighted 
by UN Women in 2020. In recent years, sport has demonstrated its enormous capacity to propel women and girls' empowerment. It mobilises the global community and speaks to youth. It unites across national barriers and cultural differences. It is a powerful tool to convey important messages in a positive and celebratory environment, often to mass audiences. In addition, it teaches women and girls the values of teamwork, self-reliance and resilience, has a multiplier effect on their health, education and leadership development, contributes to self-esteem, builds social connections and challenges harmful gender norms. While it's fantastic to recognise the enormous impact of sport, it would be naive to presume that sport programmes alone will change the lives of women and girls in the Global South. These excellent initiatives need to be embedded in wider societal change. As Maria Bobbenreath so articulately explains, The joy of sport is transformative, the humanity of it, the love and the energy. If all we could do is bring joy for one hour a week for a few years to some of these young women together, then their lives will be transformed. Joy transforms us more than anything else. But there are many strategies. This is not a silver bullet. This strategy will only help you if you've got very good other strategies. We need schools. We need to make sure girls have access to good medical facilities. We need psychological support. This is just one kind of really great booster in your toolkit. In researching and writing this chapter, I've been fascinated to learn about the impact the intentional use of sport can have on the lives of women and girls so far removed from what we see every day in the West. Inspired by the work of remarkable women like Maria Bobbenreath, Radha Balani and Alexandra Shalat, it's an area I'm now keen to explore further. Conclusion. Game on. Well-behaved women seldom make history. Laurel Thatcher Ulrich. My goal for this book was to celebrate the vast progress we have seen for women in sport, while also highlighting the inequalities that still exist today. I wanted it to be a joyful book, acknowledging all that has been accomplished as well as a rallying cry for future action. In writing it, I have learnt much more about the history of women in sport. I was shocked and disappointed to discover that so many ridiculous medical and societal assumptions from over a hundred years ago still impact attitudes to women's participation in sport today. But it is clear we are now witnessing positive change as never before. There has been a huge increase in spectators, media coverage, sponsorship and professional contracts, with female athletes leading the way as powerful activists for social change. We've seen sportswomen celebrated as strong and powerful with better gender balance on sports boards, female-focused sports science and research, and more women and girls participating in grassroots sport. As I updated this final chapter for the book's paperback edition, it's clear that the COVID-19 pandemic highlighted historical gender inequalities with women's events, leagues and competitions curtailed more readily than men's throughout 2020. Many were concerned that this hiatus would have a long-term negative impact, undoing much of the progress we'd witnessed over the past decade. And yet, despite the delays and cancellations, the unstoppable rise of women's sport continued unabated throughout 2021 and into 2022. 
Watershed moments included the FA's multi-million pound deal with Sky Sports and the BBC to broadcast the Women's Super League for the next three seasons. Barclays also renewed its title sponsorship of the WSL and doubled its investment in women's football with a £30 million three-year deal that includes title sponsorship of the Women's Championship. Meanwhile, in cricket, the 100 drew spectacular crowds and high TV viewing figures, setting records for the women's game. Hardly a week went by without news of another significant female first, whether that was Rachel Blackmore winning the Grand National, Sarah Cox becoming the first female Premiership rugby referee, Debbie Hewitt being appointed as the first female chair of the FA, or British cyclist Lizzie Dignan winning the first women's Paris-Roubaix race. Sporting bodies, leagues and teams across the world, including FIFA, unbundled their women's rights, with global brands such as Google, Nike, Mastercard, Adidas, Deloitte, Budweiser, Heineken and Michelob flocking to sponsor women's sport. New global events and formats emerged, including the Tour de France Femme avec Swift, the Arnold Clark Cup and World Rugby's WXV tournament. Wales became the first country in the UK and only the third in Europe to drop women's from the name of its female football league. And, along with Ireland and Sweden, it introduced equal pay for its men's and women's international football teams. Women's salaries in the 100 doubled for 2022, a bold move that reflected the ECB's commitment to the women's game and their ultimate goal of gender parity in wages. UEFA doubled the prize money for the women's Euros in 2022, but sadly this is still less than 5% of the men's Euros prize pot. Social issues around women's sport were also addressed in 2021 with the MCC amending the laws of cricket to use gender-neutral terms, batter and batters, rather than batsmen or batsmen. Cricket Australia, committing to address the lack of statues of female cricketers, and the International Handball Federation, finally responding to widespread accusations of sexism by changing its rules around women's uniforms to allow shorts and tank tops instead of bikinis. Looking back at how much has been transformed for women's sport in the past decade, it's exciting to imagine what could be made possible in the future by this momentum. As women's sport continues to evolve, let's not solely compare it to men's sport in order to judge its success though. Women's sport differs on so many levels and in many cases has more to offer, especially in the way it challenges society's gender stereotypes. Things are changing, but not fast enough. It is down to all of us to keep pushing for more. We can all be influencers in this space. Here are 10 steps you can take to drive change. 1. Call out the media when you see unequal coverage and praise them when they get it right. 2. Ask brands about the balance of their sponsorship. Support those that back women's sport. 3. Watch more women's sport, live when you can, or on TV or digital platforms. 4. Stand up for female athletes and broadcasters on social media. Help close down those trolls. 5. Reflect on and address your own conscious and unconscious biases towards women in sport. 6. Question the diversity of those leading the sports you love. 
Seven, support campaigns and charities that progress the agenda for women's sport. Eight, speak up when things are not fair. Be more vocal with your support. Nine, take part in sport and encourage the women and girls in your life to do the same. And ten, celebrate the success of female athletes and female leaders. It's simply not acceptable that in 2022, women's sport should still be a poor relation to men's. Women make up over half the population and, together with those forward-thinking men who appreciate the benefits of equality, our voices can be incredibly powerful. Let's all be more proactive and unapologetically demand more for everyone. Game on. Thank you so much for listening to the serialization of my book, Game On, The Unstoppable Rise of Women's Sport. If you'd like a copy, it's available in hardback and paperback in all good bookshops and online. The Game Changers podcast is free to listen to on all podcast platforms. Head over to fearlesswomen.co.uk to find out more about all of the incredible game changers I've spoken to in previous series. There are over a hundred of them, including elite athletes, journalists, coaches, scientists, broadcasters and CEOs. As well as listening to all the episodes on the website, you can find out more about the Women's Sport Collective, a free, inclusive network for all women working in sport. And you can register for the Fearless Women newsletter, a weekly review of the global developments in women's sport. Do come and say hello on social media, where you'll find me on LinkedIn, Instagram and Twitter at Sue Anstis. Finally, if you've enjoyed the podcast, I'd be so grateful if you could do two things. Firstly, if you could leave a review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, I'd really appreciate it. And secondly, if there's anyone in your life, at home or at work, who you think might enjoy the podcast, please do let them know about it and help us spread the word about women's sport and the stories of these incredible game changers.